Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director here at FaithBridge, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just brought part three of the Resolve for More series. Welcome, Pastor Ken. Thank you. Okay, so over the last few weeks, we've talked about resolving for more in our relationship with God, right. and we talked about reading our Bible, engaging mm -hmm. Him that way, mm -hmm. praying, and today we talked about another spiritual part of our relationship with this God, and that's generosity yeah. and giving. And so we did have some questions come in, Good. so I'm just going to jump right to them. Um, the first question, you did talk about the passage uh, from Matthew 6, 21, mm -hmm. where he talks about your treasure, yeah. and that's where your heart is. Yeah, it does treasure. say treasure, mm -hmm. and, and we replaced it with money. Mm -hmm. uh, is, does it always mean money? Is that always equal money? Is that well, the yeah, right. interpretation of that? I think in our time and context, the answer is yes. But let's go back to Jesus' time and context. Suppose we were living then and trafficking in a culture uh, of the, where the currency was chickens, you know, or goats or whatever. That's what treasure would be mm. in that culture. I heard um, about a, a missionary, a while back I was reading a story and he said it was so interesting. He went to a foreign country I don't remember where. And he said, in that culture, the greatest treasure was having gold teeth hmm. because the uh, indigenous people, that, that was just the sign you've made it if you had gold teeth. And he's like, that's really weird. I wouldn't really treasure having gold teeth, but that's what they did. So, uh, I think the questioner is quite right. It, it could certainly mean different things, but I think, I don't know who the questioner is, but I would imagine if he lives or she lives in uh, suburban Northwest Houston, uh, it's probably gonna have something to do with money. Yeah. I haven't met anybody who didn't. Okay, good. <laughs> Out here. Good. Um, and so you talked about the biblical principle of tithing of the save and the give and the spending. Um, when we're talking about tithing, mm -hmm. just starting at the 10%, mm -hmm. um, should we tithe on our gross or our net? Is uh, this pre-tax or post-tax? Sure. Good question. And very predictable question for this conversation. Um, well, of course, again, let's go to the times in which Jesus was speaking and teaching. I don't think they had, uh, you know, gross and net uh, structures like we did. We'd need to go back and do a little bit of research, but I think that's more of uh, the economic realities of this day and age than it was then. Uh, so the, the uh, simplest answer would be, I think, uh, well, gross. Uh, because they didn't have, you know, FICA being t taken out and all, <laughs> all the stuff that, um, but I would hasten to add, um, this whole exercise of experimenting with our stuff, our money, our treasure, and exploring the connection it has to our heart and will my heart really follow into the things of God and if I invest into the things of God? And the answer is yes, it, it will. Um, I think you could probably safely run the experiment on the gross or the net. Mm -hmm. I've heard any number of uh, clever preachers say over the years, uh, well, what do you wanna be blessed on? Do you wanna be blessed on uh, the gross or the net? And so, ha ha. So, uh, I would just mostly encourage people uh, don't get hung up on uh, this sort of minutia. Just get into the experiment and see if you don't discover what Jesus said is just 
true. Our hearts always follow the treasure. Good. Yeah. And so you you talked about um, talking through what it was like in Jesus' day in that context and applying that context here. Um, another question that we came, that came in was around the context of Malachi three ten. Okay. Um, that it was specific time and people and. Uh, how do we rightly apply this verse to believers right. today? Is it literal and direct, or is it something else? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the questioner is quite right. You always want to understand the context and make sure that we're applying a passage rightly, lest we go off and, I mean, I guess someone could very crazily think, well, cut and paste a few verses together, Judas hanged himself, go and do likewise. Well, no, that's, that's not good Bible study uh, there. Um, so is this an appropriate application? Since we are not Old Testament uh, people d dealing with the, uh, the, the situation that Malachi was addressing and, and uh, his writings to the people that he was writing, for the people he was writing. This being the case, I say yes, it is. Uh, because what was the context uh, that he was trying to, to, well, that God was speaking through him to say to these people, your hearts have gotten hard toward me. And you're, you're, you're holding back from me. And I want you uh, to, to, to test me in this. See if I wouldn't pour out the blessings of heaven if you would do what I've always asked my people to do. Didn't, I, didn't we establish you're going to be my people, Jewish people, and I'm going to be your God. And we're going to have this special connection and, and our lives are going to get all interwoven uh, together. So why are you pulling back? Why are you living this way? Well, I think that much can at least be said to be entirely applicational to us mm -hmm. as well. If, uh, if anything needed to be added, and I think it does, as New Testament people, Jesus only made more clear to us how interwoven uh, God was saying, I want our lives to be so interwoven, I'm going to come and die on a cross for you. I'm going to give everything. And then parenthetically, uh, Jesus would say to his disciples in different points, even more outlandish things than just try tithing. I mean, he, the poor widow who gave everything, he's like, now, did you see what she did? I'm telling you, that is the real deal there. And that's not going to be forgotten. Um, well, so is the application then for New Testament people necessarily, well, I, 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 got, I got to get a, a hundred percent away. No, I don't think that that would quite be it either because you do have to support your families if your families and children and feed them, clothe them, get them to school and all that kind of stuff. But I think a very good, safe, sound uh, starting point, sort of a benchmark for, for starting is to say, I'll use the standard that God was calling the people of the Old Testament back to, the tithe. I'll start there. And as God surprises me, I'll go even further. Um, I'm thinking of one person who is always quick to say, why would you hold yourself back? Um, well, he's very far along in his faith and I think is up to living off of maybe 50% of what he earns and then gives the other 50% away. Well, that's marvelous. The war lines aren't capable of, of doing it yet, uh, not anywhere near, but uh, we are beyond a tithe. I think, you know, I, th I was doing our budgeting here just the other day and I think we're up to about 13%, somewhere 13 and a half percent we're giving away. Um, in the way that we do it, 
because uh, sometimes I'll just add a question that's not asked, but it will be asked. Sometimes people ask in this subject, does it mean that you give all of it to the church or what about other organizations? Here again, I encourage people, to, let's not be legalistic and get hung up on this. Let's just get into the rhythm and into the experiment of being generous and see what happens. Uh, now, that said, the way that the War Lines, Suzanne and I do, is we give the tithe to the church. Um, the, the first tenth, we do that. Then with the other three or three and a half percent, uh, we've got a couple of compassion kids or world vision kids uh, that we support for the food and the clothing, you know, in the countries and get the letters from them and, and support some of uh, her friends from back in the days when she was on crew, Campus Crusade for Christ, and I think four or five people we support with them, and a f few other missionaries and some things like that. That's that's how we do it. Um, but anyhow, I, I, uh, I think it's very safe to say that it is not a uh, misuse of an Old Testament passage to say, let's just throw ourselves into this circle and get involved with what God was calling the people in the Old Testament. And like I said in the message, I got a file drawer full of cards and notes and emails that have come in over the years of people who've said, oh my gosh, when we started doing this, weird things, weird things good started happening. It's like, isn't that weird correlation or causal relation? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in the message, you mentioned um, that you didn't have time to get into everything about the subject, um, but you did want to talk about savings. Sure. So tell us. Yeah. Tell us Beca more about that. Because the financial planners hearing me today, uh, I'm sure we're thinking 10% of savings that, you know, or Dave Ramsey mm -hmm. uh, has always made uh, popular his seven baby steps. And one of those baby steps is get an emergency fund because if you don't have an emergency fund, then you'll eat away your savings very quickly with every, uh, you know, transmission problem you have or t the new set of tires and there's $800 and bam, you know, now my savings plan's depleted again. If we were to use the, the word picture that I was using, I think a, a very good way to present it to kids, but we kept it simple today just with three buckets, but would be to add a fourth bucket and to go uh, 10, 10, 10, 70. Hmm. 10, tithing. 10, saving, long-term, the retirement fund sorts of thing. 10, rainy day fund, emergencies. That one's gonna go up and down depending on the season that you're in, depending on what's happening to the car or the kids, you know. Um, but you build it back, it'll go down and you'll build it. 10 there and then live off the 70, which is a lot easier said than done for uh, younger people and for children people uh, who are just starting out mm -hmm. to start them on maybe a, a rhythm uh, like that. Uh, we kept it simple today, 10, 10, 80, because we find that any number of people who really haven't had any plan, this represents plenty of homework and we can, they'll get in more, you know, through a, a money wise class, or if they do a financial piece somewhere, Dave Ramsey or whatever, they'll get into more dealing with the parsing out of the savings. Okay. Uh, but one qu uh, last question that came in, um, it came from someone who says that uh, their husband is not a believer mm. and so would not be on board with the challenge. Is there a way if your spouse um, wouldn't participate or want to do it, is there a way to be part of it and still honor right. your spouse? Sure. Well, let's quickly say this. I never encourage uh, one spouse to be uh, secretive. Um, in the name of the Lord, uh, I, if they choose to do that, then so be it. And, and, but, but I don't ever want any person, especially, I don't know why I'm thinking of it this way, but especially the wife to feel like I, I really am going to do this. And pastors tell me I must do this, uh, because I think of the verses in first Peter three, 
uh, 1 through 7, where you remember the context. Peter was writing to these ladies who were becoming Christians, and they were evaluating their souls springing to life and getting excited, and they're looking at their non-Christian husbands who haven't converted, and they were asking uh, a message, uh, a question that Peter's addressing in the letter, among other things, and they're essentially saying, can I drop this guy and go start over? Go meet a new single guy who's a Christian, you know, and, and, and Peter is basically saying in those verses, no, stay in the marriage. Who knows but what if you'll just be a person of inward and outward uh, beauty and uh, a humble soul and committed to your relationship that he might not see Jesus in you and you might be the very uh, instrument that will be useful in helping him come to trust in Christ. And so I would never encourage anybody to make this uh, something that potentially drives their marriage further apart. This said, I do uh, know of several spouses. Again, I'm thinking of the females here uh, because it more times than not tends to be the males who are trying to put the ixnay on, uh, on this but who have transparently shared with their husbands, um, you know, since this percentage of the budget is mine to oversee, uh, you know, however you know, every couple works out, you know, who's in charge of this and who's in charge of, but since this is my portion, I would like to test, um, you know, take, take the test here to put the Lord to the test, as he says, I want to experiment with tithing, uh, uh, not saying you put more money, husband, into the pot here, uh, my pot, uh, but I'll still be doing, you know, the responsibilities and the, the, the division of labor, the way we've drawn it out, but I want to give. And in several instances, we've had people who've done that, and the husband's like, okay, fine. As long as this still happens and this, you know, okay, okay. So that is a way that I think uh, we could say in good conscience, why don't you run the experiment uh, that way? Um, and then your soul can feel um, fulfilled in both directions. You're honoring the Lord and you're honoring your husband, uh, both. Good. And I'm thinking one other thing that uh, sometimes is asked, and it has to do with just the blessings. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, well, because sometimes people say when you, it's like, what sort of blessings will the Lord pour out from heaven upon me? And are, are they going to be material blessings? I would hasten to add, they very well might be, but I would never presume to tell you, here's what God will do. Now, there's some preachers on TV who have watched do that. And they say, you give a dollar here and God's going to give you $10 here. I would never presume to do that. I've had any number of heartwarming stories of people who have stepped into generosity, stepped into tithing, who will say, I never got a promotion, I didn't get a raise, you know, whatever. But our marriage is so much more functional. We hardly fight anymore about finances. It's just like everything changed. Well, that's a blessing. Yeah, and the People telling me this would say, well, that's like heaven's worth of blessings, you know, to, to just to get our marriage to, to this point. So you never know how the Lord will do the blessing, but I've just seen it in any number of ways come. And it's always fun to watch that correlation or causal relationship that's happening. That's good. And I know this can be a hard area to manage, making the budget and staying to it and all those things. And so you mentioned the Money Wise class. Yep, good. I'm really excited about yep, that coming up on both campuses yep. where we'll, we will talk about budgeting and how to use tools and how to plan to give and what are your options for saving. So it's right. a great place to start if you myself, don't know where to start. I was plugging it and forgot. How many weeks is it? It's four weeks. Oh, I was mm -hmm. overestimating him in mm -hmm. there. I said yeah, five or it's six. four weeks. Four it weeks. goes uh, from after Super Bowl to before spring break. 
um, both right. campuses. So I um, hope people will join us for that. Good. Thank you for being here today and thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.